Welcome back to my mental health and crime channel. My name is Hoodie London. This is the case of the Idaho quadruple murders. The father of Kaylee Congalves says that he has evidence that his daughter fought back. And we've heard that Zana fought back too from Zana Canodal's father and from the affidavit. Every University of Idaho students gripped the nation and the school. Now the father of one of those victims is shedding some light on what happened that night. Steve Gonsalves says that there is evidence that his daughter, Kaylee, was trying to escape but was trapped both by the attacker and another one of the victims. He made that comment for an upcoming 48-hour special. Meanwhile, the suspect in the murders, Brian Koberger, back in court this week as the judge considers whether or not to allow cameras during the trial. Joining us now on all of this is Tracy Walder, News Nation contributor and former CIA officer and FBI special agent. Tracy, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Natasha. What are you tracking in terms of these new comments from Steve Consalvis? Uh, it seems he's saying that his daughter fought back, even tried to escape. It is not part of the affidavit. Um, so what are you tracking? And ultimately, could it make a difference to investigators in this trial? The difference, I'm going to start with your last question first. The difference that it really could make is in pointing towards motive, because the reality is, is if they cannot prove a motive, it's going to be very difficult um, to build the case and put Brian Koberger kind of the why um, he was at the scene and why he would do something like this. And this really goes to what I sort of hypothesized. I think it was on your show early on um, when this when this all started that I believed that um, unfortunately Maddie was probably the target um, because Kaylee wasn't supposed to be there. And Zana and Ethan, I, I believe, were probably killed last because they confronted him. And so this really speaks to the timeline. Again, why go up three flights of stairs? It's, a, it's highly risky behavior. And I do believe that she was probably targeted. So I really think um, that this will help perhaps go towards motive. I appreciate that. And what does that mean to be potentially trapped by the attacker and also another one of the victims? What are you reading into there? What, what I think, and this is just in thinking about the layout of the room, if the bed was indeed sort of pushed, think about it as like an L shape um, up against a wall, what it would have meant is that Kaylee was kind of sleeping up against that wall and Maddie would have been, you know, kind of more towards the door of the room. So the attack potentially could have been on Maddie first. Kaylee probably stirred as a result of this attack and most likely sort of had nowhere to go, kind of became sandwiched in between the wall and in between Maddie. Yeah, it's just horrific um, to, to talk about. I, I do want to ask about the trial. It does sound like the judge is leaning towards banning cameras. And this is despite the fact that two of the victim's families are emphatic that they do want cameras there. What do you think he will ultimately decide? I agree with you just in everything I've seen so far. It seems that he's leaning towards banning cameras. I think, I do think he actually took their wishes into a, into account. And that was first when he asked the media to sort of back off Koberger. He issued sort of a warning, Judge Judge did. Um, I think he feels that some media has not adhered uh, to those warnings. And as a result, that then is superseding what the family is asking for because they are not operating within the perimeters that he set with that first warning. You know, and we're also seeing reports of uh, the prison granting special requests to Koberger at this time. So we're talking about vegan food, suits, access to a computer, anything um, on that list unusual to you at this point? <laughs> No, but I get that it's really frustrating. We have this discussion in my criminal justice class with my students all the time. The reality is, is defendants have rights. Whether we like it or not, they are still innocent until proven guilty. Whether I think Koberger is guilty or innocent truly doesn't matter, and he still has rights. He has not been convicted. Um, however, he has been indicted. Therefore, he's in custody. However, they do have to adhere to the best of their abilities to his dietary standards. In terms of the suit, all he really has to do, all his attorneys have to do, quite frankly, is ask. Typically, that's done at trial because you don't want to bias a jury, and so you put the defendant into a suit. Not typically in these early hearings. That is a little unusual, but it's not that it's never been done before. Yeah, and in terms of access to a computer, especially with his background as a PhD candidate and in criminology, et cetera, um, what do you suspect he will be using it for during this time, and, and could it have any impact on the trial? 
I don't believe that he probably has, I guess we could say, unfettered access to the internet, if you will. There's probably certain times of the day and certain sites that he's able to go on. I think what he's going to use it for, quite frankly, is for his own defense. I think he thinks he's he's smarter um, than most people, and I think that's probably what he's doing is researching his defense. Okay. Tracy Walder, always appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I have read personally that Brian Koberger is allowed to use a computer or laptop so that he can check and read his affidavits and his statements, which I think is fair because he's been accused of a quadruple murder and it has nothing to do with his education and background. Every person would want to have access to the papers and imagine, in case he did not do these crimes, he needs to know what's going on. And it's just a plus that he has a PhD degree and that he's learned crime and justice, criminology, so he can see how his defense can defend him and what evidence the prosecution has on him. I believe that's his right. Nobody's guilty until proven guilty. And I do agree with the CIA agent that motive is crucial. Although motive is not important in the court, in the courts of law, motive is what leads you to understanding what was the purpose, who was the target or who were the targets. So I believe that is the reason this case is really difficult to understand because most of the things are under gag orders. The timeline has been changed. The car model that they were searching for was a 2011 to 2013 model. Brian Christopher Koberger drives a Hyundai Elantra 2015. But obviously, there is questions about why he drove to Kings Road, why his phone was on flight mode or switched off, why the leather knife sheet was found near Maddie's bed. All those would come on later on in the trial. But I don't understand why there seems to be a big discussion about what Brian Koberger eats. He's a vegetarian. He doesn't want to eat anything with meat. So we have to respect his rights too. But I heard that he does not have access to internet. And that makes more sense, obviously, because if he has access to the internet, he can be contacting people and try to change things. As for the cameras, I do understand why there's no cam why the judge doesn't want cameras in the court. Usually, they say that social media and YouTube creators have gone too far and crossed the boundaries. But I believe the media. The mainstream media plays their role too. They're busy taking pictures of wrong parts of his body where that shouldn't be taken and they're not focusing on the case that is the most important thing. We want justice for these four young students. Whether it's Brian Koberger or whether it's other suspects that are involved or whether Brian Koberger is innocent we have the right. Actually, we don't have the right, but it's important to have the camera rolling. But now, Brian Koberg has come to a stage where he doesn't want to have the camera rolling because the cameras are rolling in the wrong places, which is unacceptable. The, the mainstream media needs to take the accountability because they have to be mindful 
that this young man is being charged for quadruple murder. This is not a time of taking pictures and focusing the cameras on the wrong places. They have been warned about that and that is costing us, the public, who are really interested in seeing this case, that we may lose access to see the case. Cameras are important. We have to respect Brian Koberger and the family, his wishes and the judge's wishes. I believe that cameras are important to see exactly what is going on so that we can even learn from this case. Having a camera is having transparency so that there wouldn't be any doubts and we can see everything clearly. The prosecution has asked Amazon to submit all the list of what Brian Christopher Koberger has purchased or has even looked at in Amazon because they want to find trigger warning, the knife that was used in this crime. But what is interesting is when you listen to what the coroner said at the start, and if you read those papers, you will understand that the injuries of the four victims are not the same. We've heard that from the parents and we've heard that from the coroner. Example, Eaton Cha uh, Chapin, his injuries was caused by a edged weapon. That could be anything. That could be an axe. That could be anything. Kaylee, unfortunately, is injuries was furthermore violent and brutal than Maddie's injuries. But yet again, we've been told by the media that Maddie was the target. I do not agree with that. I personally believe that either all four of the victims were the target or the resident was a target for whatever reason or that at least three of the victims were targets. The social media is actually going more deeper into this case and we're looking at it from every angle. But the media just wants to focus on Maddie. There's no proof that Maddie was the target. There's no proof that Kaylee was the target. And there's no proof that Zana and Eaton were the target. But when you look closer into this case and you follow all the articles, even on social media, I personally believe that it was the couple, Zana and Eaton, that were the, cop, uh, the targets. There was obviously a fight in the Sigma Kyle fraternity that night at the party. And Bethany Funk was a witness because she was at the party. Let's not forget that the police was asking us, the public from the start, that they needed to know the timelines of Eaton and Zano. Why would they ask for it unless it wasn't important? It was crucial because they didn't even know where Zana and Eaton was from 9.45 to 145. I find it strange because Zana told her father clearly over the phone and her father said that. That would come out from a phone list that Zana spoke to her father. That was around midnight. She said that she's going to stay at home and order some food. Why would Zana order food at 12 at midnight? She's ordering a pizza and then order food again and order food again at 4 a.m. Did someone order the food at 4 a.m. for her? Was Zana really on TikTok? Because I believe that Zana wasn't on TikTok. 
I believe they were already unliked. There's something seriously wrong with the timeline here. I believe in the first timeline that something happened between 3 to 4 a.m. So I hope they find the motive with Brian Koberger because right now there isn't any connection with Brian Koberger and the four victims. I personally believe that this trial is going to drag on for months or even maybe a year and a half because everything is under gag order and now the prosecution wants the list from Amazon. Wasn't all this supposed to be done be at the end of the year? Within a month it's going to be, I hate to say the word, the death anniversary of these four young students. Ann Taylor is entitled to the three unidentified DNAs found in the crime scene. Why aren't they handing it over? So now we know Brian Koberger is doing his own research with his computer. And I don't think that is wrong. He's entitled to defend himself until he's proven guilty. Painting a clearer picture into Brian Koberger's life by searching through his browser history. Earlier this year, investigators issued warrants to Amazon, TikTok, YouTube, Apple, Venmo, and others to obtain Koberger's records. In the warrant to Amazon, it suggested Koberger's activity, particularly pertaining to knives, could hold clues to the murders. Koberger, of course, is accused of brutally killing four Idaho college students last year. His DNA found on a knife sheath at the crime scene. Let's welcome now legal analyst and trial attorney Misty Maris. Uh, Misty, it's always great to see you. So the prosecution in the Brian Koberger case does not have the murder weapon. It's now revealed that investigators sought Brian Koberger's Amazon purchase records and Apple data, online searches for knives. How crucial is this information in your view to their case? It is incredibly important for the prosecution's case that electronic footprint. It is incredibly important for the prosecution's case that electronic footprint unlocks so many doors as prosecutors do build their case. Because remember, on one hand, electronic footprint it can be social media posts, it can be searches, it can be location data. But on the other side, it could be information that leads to more evidence of planning and preparation for the crime. Remember, in this case, the prosecutor's theory is this was a well-planned crime, a very detailed planning that went into this. And now, seeing these social media searches and the warrants that, that, were, uh, that are out there, that leads me to believe the prosecution thinks this electronic footprint is a key and a critical component of their case. And, you know, there's been so much emphasis on the Amazon account, but documents also show a warrant for PayPal and Venmo records. What might those reveal, Misty? It's follow the money, Kelly, follow the money. Remember, we do not have the murder weapon here, uh, as, as you pointed out. All we have, the, the closest we have to that is a knife sheath which would have held a large knife. So prosecutors are doing everything they can to find out if Brian Kohlberger came into possession of a knife of the size of something that's going to match how the individuals in that house were killed. And so now we see the Amazon, what I find very interesting, it's not just looking for purchases, it's looking for detailed customer click activity. So that's not just what somebody put into their cart and ultimately bought. It could be something that you clicked on, that you looked at, that led to other searches. This is the path they're going down in order to be something that you clicked on, that you looked at, that led to other searches. This is the path they're going down in order to place that knife in Kohlberger's hands from a prosecutor perspective. Well, and to your point, Missy, does this give us any more clues as to where the knife may have ultimately been purchased? 
What it does is it gives us insight into where investigators are looking and how prosecutors are putting together the case. Remember, we have limited information from the public perspective because there's been a great deal of court orders relating to what can actually be disseminated. Now that we see these warrants, it would lead me to believe investigators think this electronic footprint, this path, through the internet, through the searches, through the history, is what's going to lead them ultimately to the murder weapon. It hasn't been found, but can they find Koberger having some interaction with a weapon that matches how these individuals were killed?